Hey everyone, today I'm going to be showing you how to measure the speed of light in different materials and talking about the world's most famous failed experiment. Now before we continue, I'd like to thank Kamikoto for sponsoring this video. Kamikoto makes amazing handcrafted Japanese steel kitchen knives using over 800 years of Japanese technology and traditional techniques. They only use steel from mills in Japan using techniques perfected by generations of knife smiths. Each knife comes in this beautiful heavy duty wooden box which makes a great presentation if you give it as a gift. They have an array of products which all look amazing with different blade lengths used for different purposes. All the blades have a satin finish on the handle and they look amazing. What's crazy is each Kamikoto knife goes through a rigorous 19 step process that takes several years from start to finish to complete. And each knife is individually inspected by a person. This is signed in pen mind you. Their knives remain affordable even though the quality is so great because they cut out the middleman and deliver the knife straight to you. Also, they have great customer service and their goal is to make the customer happy and respond to any of their needs. I've used these knives on steak and tomatoes and no matter what it is, it slices through them with no problem. The knives feel heavy duty in your hand and you feel like a real chef using them. And their knives come with a lifetime guarantee. They have a single bevel edge that can cut through meat like butter. The Kamikoto knives are so good, they're even being used by Michelin star chefs. Kamikoto is having their Valentine's sale now, and they're offering my viewers an extra $50 off any purchase they make with the discount code ActionLab on top of their other special offers. So go to kamikoto.com ActionLab or click the link in my description or the card at the top. And thanks again for Kamikoto for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to the experiment. Light doesn't always travel at the speed of light. The speed of 299,792,458 meters per second isn't the speed of light in all materials, it's the speed of light in a vacuum. So when light travels through different materials, it changes its wavelength and speed, but its frequency stays the same. The Michelson interferometer is a special device that was invented in 1887. The reason that it was invented is because at that time, they weren't quite sure how light traveled. The main theory was that light traveled through a special medium called ether. So scientists thought that the ether was all around us, all through space, and that light propagated through the ether. So two physicists named Michelson and Morley came up with a method where they tried to measure how fast the earth was moving through this ether. And the way they decided to do it was like this. They had a source of light and they shine that light through a beam splitter, which is basically just a piece of glass where some of the light travels through and some of it gets reflected. The light that passes through it hits one mirror and the light that bounces off of it hits another mirror. And the light gets reflected back off of both of those mirrors back through the beam splitter and then gets added together on some screen. Because light has wave-like properties, depending on the distance between those two mirrors, the light is going to take slightly different path lengths. And so it's not going to match up exactly where the peaks and valleys of each light wave is. So you're gonna see constructive and destructive interference. So what you end up seeing on the backstop is patches of light and patches of dark and patches of light and patches of dark. And if you were to take one of those mirrors and move it backwards by a few nanometers, then you would see those fringes move across. So by moving the mirrors ever so slightly, you can see those fringes move across the screen. Or if you change the speed of the light in one of the sides versus the other one, you'll see the fringes move. So what they said is if one of the beams is traveling parallel to the flow of ether, it will take longer to be reflected back and forth than a beam traveling perpendicular to the ether. So what their experiment was is they set up the interferometer and their goal was that they were going to turn it. And based on how they turn it, they should see the fringes move across the screen. If one of those speeds was changing relative to the ether, then they should see the fringes shift. But what they found was that no matter how they turned it, they didn't see any fringe shifting. So what they discovered is they couldn't prove the earth was moving at all. It was as though the earth had zero velocity through the ether. Now this was very surprising and very useful that finally led to the theory of relativity to show that light travels the same in any reference frame no matter what. So what I have here is, here's my laser light and then I have my beam splitter right here, just a piece of glass. And then I have a mirror right here and I have a mirror in my vacuum chamber. So the beams are gonna combine into one and go through this lens right here. The only reason this lens is here is just to spread out the beam of light to make it bigger so it's not a tiny little dot of laser light. So you can see when I turn it on, you can see that I have two dots of light here. 
but they're not stacked up together. That just means I need to adjust my mirrors a little bit. Once you get them right on top of each other. So you can see the interference pattern now. Also, you'll notice that I'm not seeing a full circle like in some interferometer experiments. That's because my mirrors are slightly askew, so you only see a linear version, not a circular version, but it still works just fine. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna pump this down and I'm gonna get a vacuum inside of here. So this path of light is going to go through a vacuum and this one isn't. And then I'm gonna turn off my vacuum pump. I have to turn off the pump because if I don't, you won't be able to see the interference pattern because there's too many vibrations. And then once I turn it off, you'll see the interference pattern and I'm gonna slowly lit in air after that. And once I lit in the air, you're gonna see the fringes start to move. And as those fringes move, you can count how many fringes move past a certain point. And based on how many fringes move, you can determine the refractive index of the gas. Okay, so let's turn on the vacuum pump. So there's some flexing that happens. These beams get off a little bit, so I need to readjust them now. Okay, turn off the vacuum chamber. Now you can see this interference pattern there. Turn off all these lights. Okay, now I'm gonna slowly lit in the air. So the reason that you're seeing the fringes continually moving across the screen here is because on the one path of light that's passing through the vacuum, yeah, that speed during that portion is continually slowing down. So that makes the peaks and valleys of the light waves destructively interfere at different points as the chamber fills with air. It's the equivalent of changing the distance between one of the mirrors so we see the fringes continually moving like in this graphic. So you can see with a pretty crude setup like this, with just a few mirrors and a laser pointer and a piece of glass, you can actually see the difference between the refractive index of a vacuum and air. And you can't just see it, but you can actually calculate it. If you count the number of fringes that move past a certain point as you're litting in the air all the way to full pressure, then you can measure the refractive index of air relative to the vacuum that it started with. This method setup is an extremely accurate way to measure distances. It's so accurate that you can even tell if there were a slight gravitational change to the light in one path versus the other one. It would cause the fringes to shift a little bit. And that's actually the method that they were able to measure gravitational waves recently. They had a long interferometer like this. Instead of a few inches of path length of light, they had miles and miles long. So if one of those path lengths of light went through some gravitational waves, it would cause the interference pattern to move a little bit and you could see the fringes move and you could calculate how strong the gravity was that it went through. And thanks for watching another episode of the Action Lab. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet and hit the bell so you can be notified when I release my latest video. And thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.